All right, let's take our Bibles tonight. We're going to be in Genesis chapter number 27. And we're going to read verses 18 through 27. I'm going to teach you tonight how to be deceived, okay? How to be deceived. Hopefully we'll all do the opposite, uh, but that is the title of our study tonight. Uh, and so Genesis 27, verse number 18, when you find your place there, let's stand together and we'll read down through verse number 27. So Genesis 27, verse number 18. And he came into his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, that I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as a smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be seated. Lord, we thank you just for your word tonight. We thank you just, just for the opportunity and the great privilege it is to be here in your house and uh, be among the saints. Lord, we thank you for all the promises just associated with prayer and the church getting together and in, in praying. We thank you that you are he that walks in the midst of the churches. And Lord, we count you as present tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, just bless us as we look into your word. And we know that you have something special for us revealed here in Genesis chapter number 27. Lord, help us to be able to take heed to it. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn uh, from what has been written for our admonition. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in Genesis chapter number 27 is one of the famous portions of Scripture where Jacob, of course, deceives his father and steals the blessing uh, from Esau, his elder brother. And a lot of times in our mind's eyes, we picture these uh, young twins, um, perhaps teenagers, 15 years old, 19 year old, or maybe early 20 year old. Uh, these twins were 77 years old when this transpired and when this took place. So they've been around uh, a little bit of time. And um, of course, Esau was the first one to come to be born. Uh, and Jacob was the heel catcher. He came out and he was holding on to Esau's heel and he would catch from Esau all of the blessings of the family. And at this moment in time, um, he is going to claim the birthright, but also he is going to claim the blessing. The birthright would have been for the oldest in the household. They would have been the patriarch. Uh, they would have really controlled the family assets. They would have got a double portion of their father's inheritance. Also, they would have been the priest for the household, and they would have ensured uh, that the household worshipped Jehovah God, in this case, these patriarchs. Uh, and um, in Jacob hoodwinks his father here. Jacob is the deceiver. He is the supplanter. Remember that he was the smooth man of the tents. He was the pie-making mama's boy. 
Uh, Esau was the man of the field. He was, uh, I really think that personally, I probably would like Esau a lot better than Jacob. I mean, I would, you know, and more in common. He had a nice, he'd have been like, kind of like bread, only red, rud, ruddy, you know, hair all over the place. And uh, out there in the field and uh, hunting. And, and um, Esau, however, the Bible says that God hated Esau. What, this man's man, this stand-up man, this guy go out in the field and, you know, shoot a big buck and bring it home and hang it up on his wall and have venison in the freezer uh, that uh, God hated this guy? Absolutely, he hated him. And the reason why is that Esau despised the covenant of God. Uh, and so they're not too far out of the blocks here. Remember that Abraham wasn't very far off um, from Noah, and Noah had a connection right there to Adam. I mean, they're already connected right back to the beginning. So they're connected back to the proto-evangelical in Genesis 3.15, where God says that the seed of a woman will bruise the serpent's head. And they knew that there was going to be an offspring coming from God uh, that, would, uh, con that, uh, that uh, by this offspring there would be the promise, redemption, of mankind, and then God uh, blesses only two generations previous there. Abraham comes to Abraham, Genesis chapter number 12, and God makes a covenant with Abraham. He says, by thee, by thy seed, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. You are in the promised line of the Messiah. And then you see Isaac, that uh, the child... Uh, born after the spirit, not after the flesh, uh, that uh, he is going to offer himself up, be a willing sacrifice. Abraham's going to take his son, his only, uh, his only son Isaac, and offer him up on uh, Mount Moriah there. And you have a lovely picture, Genesis chapter num number 19, of the cross. And, uh, and so here, Isaac and, uh, and then his two boys, Jacob and Esau are in this lovely line. Uh, and this line meant everything in the world to Jacob, but m meant next to nothing uh, to the child Esau. Uh, Jacob, God loves. And you think, how could God love this used car salesman, right, um, who is constantly deceiving people? How could he love him but a good stand-up guy like Esau could he hate? Well, just remember this, that, that Jacob is going to have a lot of things wrong in his life. So he's got 99 problems, but loving the covenant of God and loving the blessing of God was not one of his problems. That Jacob's going to be worked on by the Lord. Now, uh, it's never profitable and it wasn't profitable for uh, Jacob to be a deceiver. In fact, when he gives a report to Pharaoh at the end of his life, about his life, he says, my days have been few and evil. And it is, if you're a liar, uh, you're going to end up like that. Uh, but God is going to work on Jacob. God's going to change his nature. Uh, that the nation of Israel is going to be named after Jacob. He is going to be the favored patriarch that God will name his people after. God is going to transform Jacob. Uh, remember when, when Jacob is heading back into the promised land, he has this wrestling match with God, and uh, God says, uh, let me go, the day now breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I mean, Jacob was willing to do anything for this blessing, even plot, lie, cheat, steal, <laughs> whatever needed to be done. In his mind at this point, the end justified the means. He was a very pragmatic thinker, uh, but he is after this blessing. Isaac in the story was 137. So you can still be deceived at 137 years old, okay? Uh, we always say too soon, old or too late smart, but some, you know, but there is also that saying, there ain't no fool like an old fool. And at 137 years, uh, Isaac had not grown in spiritual maturity. He had grown in carnality. Uh, and he was really, in essence, a backslidden man at 137. Uh, now, he thinks he's going to die. Um, if that's the case, he was in hospice for another 41 years. 
okay? And so he still has got a long life ahead of him, uh, but he is thinking that he is going uh, to die. Rebecca also uh, believes that the end justifies the means. And so um, Jacob, of course, is her favorite. And, uh, of course, God spoke to Rebecca and said that, uh, that the... Uh, the elder shall serve the younger. And of course, this information was passed on to Isaac. Isaac knew the will of God, uh, but Rebekah was wanting the will of God to be done. And Isaac was not going to do the will of God. And she, like every good wife, should plot and scheme behind her husband's back and got her children involved in this plotting and scheming to get the will of God done uh, here on this earth. Uh, and so... Rebecca thinks the ends justifies the means, but we see in the Bible repeatedly that the ends do not justify the means. For instance, Moses kills the Egyptian, right? Forty years in the backside of the desert. Uh, David uh, thinks, you know, I was reading something here, um, and I, I had to verify this, but when the priest carried the Ark of the Covenant, it was like every six steps or something like this, an altar had to be built and a sacrifice had to be made as they transported the ark. Uh, and so David, instead of uh, having this long ritual of transporting the ark uh, there into Shiloh, he says, well, just put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And Uzzah, which means strong, uh, if anything bad happens, he can help God out and reach forth and stabilize the ark. And so we see this repeatedly in the Bible. The ends don't justify the means. It's never right to do wrong to do, or never wrong to do right to do wrong. Something like, yeah, right to do wrong to do right. Right? Am I right? Am I right? Okay. Uh, and so we're going to see this in this story. Uh, one thing we appreciate about the Bible is that the Bible is absolutely honest. Uh, you know, uh, most historians, Napoleon said this about history, history is lies agreed upon by the scholars. And so, like, if you win the war, you get the right to history. The reason why we revere the Founding Fathers so much is because we won the Revolutionary War. If we lost the Revolutionary War, we would read about these demons of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, these scum of the earth who tried to overthrow the crown. Can you picture that? That's what we would have learned at school. But here's the thing about the Bible that is so unique is that you cannot say that the Bible heralds and, and propagandizes uh, the, the saints of the Bible or the Jewish people themselves. I mean, the, God always paints a clear picture of his saints, uh, and he always teaches us and reveals to us uh, all their faults and all their foibles. Charles Spurgeon said this about, uh, about this uh, chapter. He says, The Holy Spirit does not write for the credit of man, but for the glory of God. I was reading one time about uh, Abraham Lincoln, and uh, he was getting his painting done. They still do this today. Uh, is a professional painter will come in and paint the presidential portrait. I mean, this is the official portrait for all of history of what the president looked like. And so this was very important. Of course, by Abraham Lincoln's day, they did have photography, but this was very important way back in these days to get what they looked like. And he, he noticed his portrait that the painter was not painting his warts. He says, paint my warts as well. And uh, that's exactly what the Lord does with his saints in the Bible. You can be thankful that your name and your details of your life are not in the Bible, and I can be thankful the details of my life are not in the Bible as well. I, I prefer to remain anonymous and not have for all of eternity uh, my name down there in all the times I failed uh, the Lord. Well, this undoubtedly is a great failure in the life of Isaac. Uh, number one way that Isaac was deceived is that he had an unchecked appetite. One thing is known about Isaac is his appetite. And the Bible reiterates this over and over again. Uh, and here's where we learn uh, from Scripture as well, uh, that the key to, a, key to a man's heart is through his stomach. See? Look at verse number four of our chapter. And he says, And make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. 
We could read this whole statement. We see he says, I and I and I and I and savory meat. Look down at verse number 9. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two kid, kids of the goats, and I will make for them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. Look at verse number 14. And he went and, he, and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat, such as his father loved. Verse number 17, she gave him the savory meat. Verse number 19, look at the bottom of the verse, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. Verse number 25, and he said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison. Um, so, here Isaac, he loves savory meat. You know, the Bible mentions, and we'll look at uh, one of the reference too, uh, again and again and again. He had this one unchecked, unfettered appetite, this one thing that he desired. Now, it's an interesting thing that guy's dying, but he still has a very healthy appetite, and, um, and he wants to eat this savory meat. Um, the number one appetite of your flesh is eating. The one thing that you were born with, and that is a desire to eat. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. I've been there for three births, and every single one of those babies came out hungry. And, uh, and it's interesting, you know, in our life and when we're trying to suppress the flesh, and we're trying to uh, live to the Spirit. God has given us this wonderful avenue that Jesus said that you are blessed if you do this. Uh, he said, when you fast, do not fast to be seen of men, but fast before thy Father which seeth in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And there's multitudes of promises about how you suppress that carnal appetite. You can minister to the Spirit. Now, um, if you can suppress your appetite, your food, there's not very much else in life really you can enjoy on an empty stomach. I don't know if you've been there, but it's just, you know, uh, I mean, that is that number one avenue of that flesh. Um, it's mentioned in, in, in um, Philippians, chapter number three, verse number 19, it says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. Their mind is on their belly. So in a sense, our appetite pictures our own flesh and our own fleshly desires. And uh, here in Isaac, his life is overrun and his life is overruled about what he wants in this present world. And here's one of the most important times in his entire life where he's passing down on the blessing and he's able to be hoodwinked by the flesh. Uh, there's, one, there's one way that uh, Rebecca knows that she can deceive Isaac. He really likes savory meat. And if you bring in some savory meat before him, uh, he's going to be able to smell that. Uh, he's going to start salivating and he's going to stop using his brain cells and he is going to have a lack of discernment because of his appetite and he's going to make a poor decision. So if I can appeal to your fleshly appetite, I can get you to buy into anything. Uh, I, get, I get emails all the time from princes in Africa who want to will to me their wealth. You know why I get emails from princes in Africa who want to give me their wealth? Do you think that's real? Yeah. It is? Should I give my social security number? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll definitely do that. Because there's somebody out there who wants money so badly that they're going to be blind to the fact that they are absolutely being deceived. And so deception comes from an unchecked appetite. Uh, Warren Wearsby said this, he says, the end of life reveals the ends of life, what you live for. He said, P.T. Barnum at, on his deathbed said, what were today's receipts? What, what, was, what was he interested in? Uh, the day that he died, how much money did I make today? Um, Napoleon on his deathbed said, army, head of the army what he connected with. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, who is, uh, of course, out, outdoorsman and the poet and lived in nature. His last two words were moose and Indian. Isaac's was savory meat. 
savory meat. Those would be good final words, wouldn't they, Jim? Jim likes going to uh, Texas Day Brazil and um, savory meat. Uh, here's a statement from this book, this is a book I was reading, but this is Michael Frisbane. He said, and he argued that the entire cycle of Jacob, again, this is very important because Jacob, we read about this character and there's so many faults with him, but he says the, the entire cycle of Jacob is structured through a reiteration of a pun on Baraka, it's a Hebrew word, meaning blessing and birthright. That's the entire cycle of Jacob's life. The one thing that he is interested in is birthright and blessing. He says the account of Isaac employs taste in connection with wild game to give focus on that narrative. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. This foreshadows Isaac's defining moment of failure when he seeks to bless profane Esau and not elect Jacob because his moral taste had become jaded by his sensual appetite. The words that occur over words that occur over and over again saying game ten times, ten times in the Bible in regards to Jacob, and tasty food six times. Isaac is said to have loved tasty food by Rebecca, Isaac himself, and the narrator uh, is here's the, here's the story's message. Isaac's cupidity has distorted his spiritual taste. He has given himself over to his indulgent sensuality. Look, if you will, to Genesis chapter number 25. Look at verse number 22. Genesis 25, 22. So here, Isaac and Rebekah, it seems like they're off to a great start. They're going to intercede uh, for children. God hears their prayer, answers their prayer. Verse number 22, when the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her room, womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in the tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Uh, and so here is his sensuality taking over his spirituality and he loves the carnal man uh, that is after the flesh instead of loving the man uh, that is after the spirit. And so it's easy to get deceived when your flesh is in the driver's seat and you live your life and, uh, and make your decisions and make your choices on whatever pleases your flesh. Look, if you will, uh, to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12, read through Hebrews, actually this morning, um, it's in my Bible reading, and that was on, that was on the uh, docket, Hebrews, and um, so read through it, and Hebrews is a moving book, it's all about moving into the promised land, it's all about moving out of the old covenant into the new covenant, how Christ had provided better things for us. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 12 talks about, you know, Hebrews 11, that great faith race. Uh, now we're looking unto Jesus, author and finisher of our faith, compass about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Consider Jesus, lest you be weary and you faint in your minds. Uh, and then he says to us, this is you and I, in regards to Esau, uh, it says in, in verse, uh, look at verse number 12, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So you and I, we're pressing towards the mark. We're pressing towards a high calling that is in Christ Jesus, uh, that we are supposed to uh, keep going for the Lord. 
And then it says in, in verse number 13, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without uh, which no man shall see the Lord. Now look at this. We're supposed to, in verse number two of that same chapter, look unto Jesus. But then it says, look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Uh, and so, don't you want to work on Sundays, Luke? I mean, you get... You know, when I was in the grocery store, you got $2 extra per hour if you worked on Sundays. Fortunately for me, I had many people whose soul was worth $2 extra an hour. All right? And so I had no problem filling in those slots on Sunday. Okay. Uh, but there's some people who, for one morsel of bread, um, you put Jesus in front of them, and you put one morsel of bread in front of them, I'll take what I can see. I'll take the morsel of bread. I don't know about this blessing stuff. I don't know about this promise stuff, this covenant stuff living. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and have what I can see, what I can taste, what I can smell. Uh, I'll go ahead and have it now. Now, remember, whatever you do in, in, in a, a little in your own life will show up in magnitude in your family. So who was the favorite child of Isaac? Esau. Guess what Esau sold his soul for? Tasty meat. Isn't that a scary thing? Now Isaac, now you got to be careful because like for instance, Abraham took Lot down to Egypt and then when they came up out of Egypt, uh, Abraham had a stronger walk with God than Lot did. He was saved somehow. At least that's what Peter thinks in 2 Peter. Just Lot. Uh, and he was saved. And because uh, the Bible says so. And uh, I don't agree with Peter, but I do agree with the Holy Spirit who. <laughs> um, and so, but he comes up out of Egypt, takes Hagar with him. That, that caused a little bit of problems for the Jewish people. Uh, but then also, when Lot comes up out of, of uh, Egypt, he sees a well watered plains of, uh, that reminded him of Zoar in Egypt. He got a taste for the world uh, down in Egypt, and Abraham could handle the temptation, but Lot could not, and it destroyed Lot's family because of the carnality. And here we see Esau, that this is a profane person which God hates in Romans chapter number nine, who ends up in hell. Why? Because he was going to make his decisions determined on his carnality and not on his spirituality. Look, if you will, to Hebrews 8. So you and I, so what does this have to do with I? We're not the promised seed, you know, we're not, uh, we're not Jews, we're, we're not after uh, the physical line of Abraham. Uh, it says in Hebrews 8 that we have something better provided for us, okay? Hebrews chapter number 8, and it says in verse number 5, that first covenant is served as an example of a verse number 5 of Hebrews 8, it says, who serve on us as an example, a shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the, holy, in the mount. Uh, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. 
and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Uh, so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the um, Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, all belong in the old covenant, the Old Testament, which was fulfilled and all the promises of the Old Covenant were fulfilled by uh, Jesus Christ, the death of the testator, the blood, and then there's the blood of the New Covenant, which is shed for us. Now, you and I, yeah, unlike Jacob, we don't have an Abrahamic covenant. We have a new covenant. And so the writer of Hebrews says, here's what you need to learn from Esau. Don't be like Esau and sell your covenant and your covenant blessings for one morsel of bread, is so you value that um, the promise of God above anything fleshly. So number one way to get deceived is give in to your appetite. Number two, let someone else speak for God. So Jacob's going to go in there and um, with tasty meat, smell wafting over into Isaac there, and uh, Genesis 27, verse number 20. Isaac said to his son, so here's, here's what I'm saying, something's wrong here. I just sent you out in the field 10 minutes ago and you come back and you've got a prepared meal. It's like, how did this happen? Um, so it's, some sort of senses are kicking in with Isaac, but in verse number 20, and Isaac said unto his sons, how is it, that thou hast found it so quickly, my son. And he said, Because the Lord thy God gave it to me. So here comes Jacob, and he says, The Lord gave it to me. That's how. Now let me ask you a question. Was he Esau? Did the Lord give it to him, venison? No. Lie after lie. Uh, and then here is the deceiving clause here. And if you want to fool anybody, here's all you have to do is say, I prayed about it and the Lord gave me peace. <laughs> really? So you, you left your wife and you're living with your girlfriend and you prayed about it? And Lord, I mean, yeah, you'll hear any, any manner of sin. I prayed about it and the Lord gave me peace. Uh, here's another way to, to hoodwink somebody. Um, we won't get into this, but commandment number two, thou shalt not take the, the Lord's name in vain. Um, you know, this primarily does not have to do with cursing. This has to do with attaching the Lord's name to something that the Lord's name is not attached to. Okay? So you're speaking on behalf of the Lord. And so I could very easily do this thing. Um, I was preparing something, but... The Lord wanted me to tell you this tonight. Really? You know what your intent is? You go, whoop. Oh, okay, Jacob, let's hear what you got. You know, sir, you know let's hear what you got, sir, planting, lying, deceiver. Um, and so he says, the Lord says, and that's very dangerous. So he's taken in the authority of God. And this is what we call um, spiritual abuse. We had to be very, very careful about putting words into God's mouth. And even a lot of times people, I've seen preachers get up and they preach doctrine from some personal thing that happened to them where they embellish the details of their stories and then they try to teach this doctrine from their own personal life experience. I don't think so. That is not, you know, the Bible says, try the spirits whether or not they be of God. I'm always cautious too when somebody starts hollering and screaming. You know the best way to make a weak argument? Start hollering and screaming. 
I mean, in case you need to know, uh, if you don't, if you don't really have any uh, any substance to what you're about to say, start hollering and screaming. Uh, and so you can see this with your children, you know. Timmy, pick up your room. Adriana says, "No, I'm not gonna pick up my room. Get out of here." Mommy said, "Pick up your room." You see how that changed? All of a sudden, he thinks that if he doesn't clean up his room that he is disobeying mommy and so somebody comes and says you know God said this or God told me this or God wanted me to tell you I be like whoa okay all of a sudden the antenna needs to go up because uh, Jacob's about to hoodwink you into doing something that God has not done or said or moved and so uh, red flags go up Isaac initially. How did you find it so quickly? The Lord gave it to me. Jesus said this in Matthew 15, 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. People are being taught the commandments of men for doctrines of God. And so the people followed the teachings of men, thinking that they were following God, when in actuality they were uh, following the teachings of men. Uh, so here's one of the things, and here's one of the reasons why uh, that, uh, that preaching is to be done uh, from the Word of God. It says, preach the Word. And so all true preaching is going to be expounding the explanation of the Word of God. I know up at Fort Drum, you know, we, we never got independent fundamental Baptists, like never, ever. Like, I could count on my hand how many times we got the families. So what we did was teach the Word of God. I always said this. I said, listen, I hold out. I said, if I say something and you don't see it in the Bible right there in front of you, you can't say this, yeah, he's, say, he's saying what God is saying there. And you don't see it in there, just drop it. You don't have to do it. Forget about it, as they say in Italian. Forget about it. Forget about it. And so uh, preaching is, is where you're supposed to look at the book and say, yes, this is indeed what God is saying. Therefore, I must do it. Uh, so the second way to be deceived is let someone speak for God uh, for you. Number three, and then we're done. Look at verse number 21. Make your decisions based on feelings and not on the spoken voice. Notice this. Uh, verse number 21. And Isaac said unto, unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice. Notice the voice is Jacob's, but he feels like Esau. And that meat smells so good right now. And I am so hungry, even though I'm on my deathbed. I'm very hungry. I'm ravenous. Dying makes you hungry, man. And so, uh, so the next thing is feel and felt. Now, uh, in Scripture, there's the, the law or the rule of interpretation of first mention. A lot of first mentions are in the book of Genesis. For instance, blood. Do you know that blood speaks? If you look up the first uh, reference of blood, you see that, uh, that uh, Abel's blood speaks to me from the ground. And we know that the sacrifice, that blood, we say, we say the blood of Christ speaks for me. The blood of Christ speaks on your behalf. That shed blood speaks on your behalf. Um, there is love. The first mention of love we have in the Bible is Abraham's love for Isaac, his son. So if you want to know what love is, it's the father for the son. That reminds you of anything? Um, the first mention of worship in the Bible. You want to know what worship is? It's going like this. Um, or like this. Or like this. <laughs> um, worship in the Bible, the first mention of worship uh, that, that Isaac tells, uh, no, I'm sorry, Abraham tells the servant that I and the lad will go worship on that hill. And he's going to go offer up Isaac, his son. Holy, the first mention of holy in the Bible is take thy shoes off for the place where thou standest is holy ground. And, and so we can learn this. The first mention in the Bible of feel and felt Right there. So let me ask you a question. 
here's another way to, here's another way to, um, I love when someone says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you from my heart tonight. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 9, right? Uh, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we don't make decisions that we are not to make spiritual decisions based on feeling. I remember, side note, but a lady called me one time. This is when I was up in Fort Drum, and she talked about um, some, some church that she went to, and she, she wanted to know what kind of uh, music we had, and she said, um, you know, I went to such and such church, and you know, they, they had this praise and worship music, you know, music there, and I, you know, and I could just feel the Holy Ghost there. I said, okay, okay. Um, well, we're a simple Bible preaching and teaching church, and we, you know, we sing biblical based doctrine, uh, you know, on, in our hymns and things. And uh, but I, what I want to say to you, yeah, you you felt uh, some ghost there. It might have been Casper the ghost. Uh, some sort of spirit, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, was there. Uh, and, but she was going to make her spiritual decision based off of what? Feeling. Uh, and so make this, when, if you want to be deceived, number one, have an unchecked appetite. Don't crucify the flesh. Just live after the desires of the flesh, and you will make a bad decision. Number two, uh, let someone speak for God. It's amazing how many people, uh, you know, you look at... Uh, the number one preachers on the internet. Some of these guys, man, get a million downloads per sermon. It's amazing. Go ahead and watch it sometime. And how very little scriptural content will be in that whole sermon. You let somebody else put words into God's mouth. Number three, make a decision that is based on feeling and not on the spoken voice. So here is in conclusion. Don't be deceived. Get your appetite under control. Don't let someone else speak on God's behalf. Do not make decision based on feelings, but on a voice, God's voice. Here's how this all ends up. Isaac in the chapter, he ends up trembling when he finds out Esau's come in. Um, here's the thing about um, the end justifies the means. This doesn't work out good for Rebecca. Rebecca never sees her favorite child again. Uh, Jacob is going to run away for 20 years and then there's going to be uh, enmity between Jacob and Esau that's going to have to be healed, on, healed later. Uh, es Esau is going to end up in hell because of his, part of the reason, because of his father's unchecked appetite. Um, later on, Jacob's boys are going to, what's good for dad's good for us. They're going to hold up a bloody coat of Joseph and say, is this your son's coat or not? Same thing's going on here. Uh, and so we see here three amazing things in this portion of Scripture. Three amazing points that will either deceive us or if we take those into account, keep us from being deceived. So let's stop there and uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for just the clarity of Scripture. We thank you for this, uh, this story in this account here of Isaac and Jacob, and Lord, I pray that you would help us just, um, just to have spiritual discernment. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to be deceived. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. I want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.